you know, I know I'm going to say the cliche thing. It's an honor for me to be up here, and um, it's beyond an honor. And everybody wearing these uniforms out there, um, you're about to enter a life of glory. And I want everyone to look around right now because it may not always be like this. And look at the men to the left of me, to the right of me in the audience, and sometimes that just needs to be said. And uh, I think about the 320 plus World War II veterans I've met uh, come and go, and uh, we're honored to be amongst them because our children may never get to talk to a World War II veteran one day. That being said, let's turn it into a happy time now. And I'm here with these gentlemen who helped save the world 80 years ago. I'm gonna gauge our questions kind of of what you think now, 80 years ago. Um, to the right, I have Jack Moran, who served with the 87th Infantry Division. I got Bob Chunard, 128th Triple Anti-Aircraft Battalion. I got my buddy Bud here, 42nd Infantry Division. I got Rob with the 97th Infantry Division. And we got Jack Myers, who served with the Tank Destroyer Battalion in the 104th Infantry Division. Let's hear it up for these uh, World War II veterans. Here. And I love that we have sometimes not so much uh, famous divisions with us. You know, a lot of focus is put on things um, that received a lot of Hollywood attention from certain units. But the first division I'm going to talk about is the 87th Infantry Division. And Jack, uh, my question is for you, World War II, now we're at almost 80 years ago, in just a couple months, has your vision or um, your contribution has it become more of a bigger picture now, after 80 years now, compared to when the war was going on? Uh, now, it's, we are not impressing the young, the young people in the country as much as we should. Uh, the older people, the, the, the people in the audience, they appreciate what we did and what we went through, but the, we're having trouble getting the young kids. I, I give talks at schools and these, Kids are very interested in what I'm saying, but I, in the general population, I don't sense patriotism as much as I'd like to see. And do you wish to share a particular story about uh, France or Belgium or Germany of your time during the war? Well, I've got several. That you want me to... Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick uh, the town of Obergelbach, if you could tell these gentlemen what you had to face there. Yeah, uh, this was down near the German border, and we were order to attack this hill and, and capture this hill that had some, obviously they said, the, the brass felt it has some strategic importance. Uh, I, I don't know about that. So we, we attacked this hill late one afternoon, charging up the hill. The Germans were dug in very deeply on this hill, and, uh, but we still had to proceed. We lost uh, quite a few fellows going up. Uh, one of, my, one of my good friends from New Hampshire, he went running out in front of us, firing a BAR from the hip. And some of you guys had BARs. That's not an easy job to do, to fire a, a BAR, but he fired it, firing up, up down the hill. He was given the Silver Star for that. Uh, three of my friends were killed at the base of the hill. One was the grand uncle, great uncle of this young man sitting right here. Uh, and. Uh, but we finally, we finally got to, made it to the top of the hill. The 105s, our 105s were coming in over our head and crashing in front of us to keep the Germans going. Uh, I'm gonna jump ahead on the story. The, the gentleman in our spotter, our, our, our artillery spotter, for that, that night and for many nights, a guy named Bob Jacoby, and on, Valentine's Day, 1945, Bob was in a second floor. Where he always had to be on the second floor to see where the shells were landing. <coughs> and Bob was in this room of this house. And an 88, a German 88, a tremendous weapon the Germans had, came zipping through the window, exploded in the room, and hit Bob badly. Hit a big piece of shrapnel ripped out his, his left kidney, plus other, did other internal damage. So Bob's laying on the floor, bleeding to death. And um, a few minutes later, the Germans attacked us and drove us out of that house. 
And we, we, can't, we couldn't take Bob with us. We, we couldn't get out ourselves if we took Bob. So, so we, uh, we, we, left, we left Bob laying in the house. I talked to Bob a number of times. He said three Germans came, in, <coughs> came into the room after they had taken over. Bob said, I expected one of them to pull out his Luger and come over and put a bullet through my head and put me out of my misery. But one of the Germans was a medic, and he had medical supplies with him, and he bound Bob up real tight. <laughs> he, he bound Bob up real tight to stop the yeah. blood from leaving his body. He was still bleeding internally, of course. <clears throat> and this German in broken English told Bob, he said, I hope you are able to get some medical attention. Uh, Fifteen minutes later, we reattacked the building, drove the Germans out, and got Bob out and turned him over to the medical people to see oh. if Bob, Bob lived. Uh, he, he didn't have a good life, and he, he, he died about three years ago. of one of your comrades who's here today. If you could stand up and we could honor your uncle and God bless you, sir. <laughs> I'm gonna jump to uh, Robert because the 97th Infantry Division is not a, a, a unit a lot of people know about and I know you guys arrived relatively late in the war but saw heavy combat uh, going into Germany. Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Well, we were on the Pacific coast, and all of our training was Pacific landings. We landed on San Clemente, San Nicolas, and the Marine base in Oceanside, and our voyage was going to be probably Iwo, but they came in one day and said, grab your gear, we're moving. We went to the east coast, and that was when uh, Germany surrounded Bastogne, and we were sent there. And, uh, we got there a little bit late, but I always like to say when Adolf heard I was coming, he <laughs> receded Bastogne, so I saved Bastogne. <laughs> and then we went from there back into central Germany, across the Rhine, up the uh, Ruhr Valley to Dusseldorf. And they wanted us to get to Dusseldorf before the Russians, but we kind of got there about the same time. And we had 40, 45 days of battle there, no change of clothes, no change of underwear, no hot food, <laughs> a roof over our head, two nights, got shot at every day for $30 a month minus $9 for insurance. <laughs> so a uh, little, little bit of humor even in the war. Uh, luckily, I won the lottery. I was to go to the French Riviera for three days R&R, &R, and the day before I was supposed to leave, grab your gear, we're going. We went east in the Patton's Third Army, and having not had a change of clothes for almost 50 days, they stopped the trucks. We got out. Here's a huge, big plunge that the engineers got the pool warm. We all had a together bath and got new clothes. And what, what, a, what a feeling. And then we kept uh, on going and, uh, in thir Patton's Third Army, and uh, this is kind of a funny story. Uh, we had some skirmishes on the way, but we went into Czechoslovakia and uh, we freed 50,000 prisoners in Marienbad, mostly women. But going back two days, I got a package from my mother, one of two that I got as a 12 she sent, all homemade cookies. I stuffed my pockets and I was eating cookies, cookies, cookies. And when we freed all those pr prisoners, it was one big happy party that night and I'm over in the corner curled up with the worst stomach ache I ever had. <laughs> the next day the orders came down, no fratters as a nation. So I missed out on a lifelong party. So uh, then we went back into uh, Germany and the writer uh, came by and told us the war was over. And it, I best describe that's my feeling and I best describe it as football game, you're on the one foot line, you're behind four points and there's 20 seconds to go. You got two plays to run one foot and you win the game and the clock goes off, the game is over. You want one or two more plays 
And that's the feeling I had that day. But the next day, it had all sunk in, and we were elated. Yeah. So uh, we uh, went back to France. We had a company meeting. We're going home for the month of July, 30 days at home. Long, long pause. But you're going back to uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, six-week refresher course, and on to the Pacific. We were to be in the base in Japan. So we got back to uh, North Carolina, and the war ended. In two weeks, we were in Seattle on a freighter, half-loaded, out in the Pacific. The next day, they come by with the order. All GIs that had 45 points or more didn't have to leave the United States. We all had more than 45 points. So we spent 37 days on the freighter from Seattle to Yokohama by way of Honolulu. Uh, we stopped at Iwo Jima, and then we were the second shipload to unload on Japanese soil in 1945. Quickly, can you tell us how the German civilians were to your division coming into Germany? Uh, standoffish, standoffish. We never touched. One time we went through a house, cleared it, and here was all this food cooking on the stove, but we were afraid to eat it that it had been poisoned when they, they left. So it was back to K-rations. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Bud, yes, sir. not every division is a liberating unit uh, per se as far as going through the gates of a concentration camp. Um, <laughs> and at Dachau <laughs> Concentration Camp, your unit logo is on a plaque there. Um, were you one of the men that Yes, I was. Um, I was about two hours late to get any jobs. There weren't many jobs to do uh, because uh, it's obvious you know, the gates were open and, the, and we had to keep them from, the prisoners from coming out. And that was a little bit of a hard job. But um, I was just there two hours after they opened the gates. And of course, I saw all the what you've seen in pictures, which is horrible. But they asked me to go through, um, I may have mentioned this once before, but it's, it is memorable. They asked me to go through, me and um, about four or five other guys, to go through a woods, thinking that some of the guards would, would try to get through the woods and, and escape. <clears throat> so we did, and we're walking along, and all of a sudden, these uniform on and then he started crying and he, re he went down to my boots and kissed my boots that was very very moving wow. thank you for sharing that story yeah. um, you know I, I went straight to that question because I, I that's not a lot of um, things a lot of World War II veterans can say you know yeah um, Jack hey how you doing? <laughs> All right, I'm awake. <laughs> tell us what a tank destroyer is. Can you tell us? Well, yeah, I, a tank destroyer, I was a tank destroyer gunner. Uh, from the time I went into war, through the war, and the end of the war. And it was a great outfit. I couldn't have been in a better outfit. We were trained. <coughs> Wow. Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> we were trained uh, in, in the camps here in, in the United States with every weapon that we would ever use over there in, a, in the best way that we could be trained, and that was very important when I got into combat because when I got to the Ruhr River, I went from a toad man on the back of a half track to an M36 with a 90 millimeter on it. And then I woke the Germans up, I'm telling you. But uh, it was it was just uh, one well not wonderful but I mean it was a great outfit and I was proud to be part of it but I couldn't talk about it like this for I mean I guess fifty years I'd break down because I lost so many friends you know over there and then I, that would but then about oh maybe uh, 
five years ago, I was in Richmond down there on a, with, a, with my outfit. We, meet, we still meet every year, 692nd Tank Store Battalion. Still meets every year. I think I'm the only one left. I'm 100 years old. But uh, it's a great outfit and it's a great meeting, you know. So uh, we, uh, we went into uh, France right after the invasion and then we were ordered to go up and uh, free the ho Holland in the Battle of the Market Garden. And we fought with the English infantry and the 104th infantry was a great companion too in, in the fighting. Uh, and that was the American Infantry Division. And uh, so we went up there and we fought through the Battle of the Market Garden until we freed, uh, we freed the, with the, we had uh, paratroopers too. And uh, I'm telling you, some of those guys were terrific too. One of it, well, I met one of them and he, he said he parachuted down on the ground right in front of us. And he said, as soon as he got on, hit the ground and got a terrific barrage of mortar shells and he ran over in the ditch to protect himself and he jumped right into a German's arms. <laughs> so he, he said, I was about ready to give up and the German said, here, I give up. <laughs> so, well, you know, it was coming down to, he realized that he might as well give up, so he did. So he gave up and he, that was great. And, uh, so anyway, we, we fought through that and came down and went through the pillboxes up into Germany and we were headed up to, to the Ruhr River and we got a call from uh, General Patton over the Battle of the Bulge was just starting in December and we had to go over and stop the tanks, help him stop the tanks, so we, which we did. Boy, that was a cold battle over there too. Mm. But we were glad to be able to go over there and uh, even with our half track and, and my 75 millimeter, we were able to, to help him out and stop those tanks by, by eliminating the, where they could regas them up and everything. Hey, without gas, they're sitting ducks. But they're still not, hard, not easy to knock out because do you know how much the Tiger tank weighed? 72 tons. You can't knock that out in, in front because the, 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 the armor was that thick too. Mm -hmm. And slanted, you can't knock that out unless you get around to the rear and go in through the gas tank, which we, which we tried to do. But then they had a swivel 88 on their tank, so you know, we had to be <laughs> careful too. So we, we got knocked out too, you know, sometimes. But, mm. but that's war. But we got through that, and then we, we get up to the Ruhr River after the uh, Battle of the Bulge, and we couldn't cross because of the, all the bridges were bombed down. Well, we sat there, and we, we, we fought, we, we shot uh, our, uh, guns over the people, uh, the, the men building the pontoon bridge for us. We, we, we just protected them while they were doing that. And then here, this is this Christmas coming up here, Christmas. So we got a command to stop firing on Christmas Day. Guess what? The Germans stopped firing too. <laughs> so here we had a silent time. Now I'm thinking about home and looking at some cars and stuff like this. And all of a sudden, across the Ruhr River, they started to play Christmas Carol with the band. We sang with the German band. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so that, you know, sitting there and w hoping that you could be home and wondering, you know, how it was going and stuff. But those are some of the memories that you have to, I'm just glad, I'm 100 years old. And I'm just glad I can remember those things. And some of them were so bad, I couldn't even talk about it for 50 years. Now, one, one, one more story. We, we uh, We're pinned down one in Germany there. We couldn't move, and my lieutenant commander, he came over and he said, Jack, I want you to put a shell in that church window down there, 500 yards away. He says, I think they're directing fire on me. So I, I, I had a 90 millimeter in, and I, and I whirled that thing around, and I put an HD shell right into the window. 
and we could move on unimpeded from them. So, you know, I was just doing my duty. But then I got this medal right here from the War Department after the, and the citation to come down to Washington to get this. Nice. For saving a bunch of men in that battle, you know. Right. But I was just doing my duty. But evidently my lieutenant wrote, a, wrote that into the War Department and then they did that. And they called me up and wanted me to come down to Washington to give me this. And I told them, I said, I'm sorry, I can't come down there. I got a bowling banquet. <laughs> but you know what? That was the best thing because they come up to my legion and brought the whole gang up there with, with drinks and food and, and I could have I could have my hometown people there. Nice. While they gave me this. Isn't that wonderful? It's awesome. So Well, I tell you, I could go on and on, but I want to tell you one more thing. I'm so impressed with this trip. This hotel, in my 100 years, I've never seen one like this. <laughs> I mean, to tell Jack, you, it's, it's, do, you, do you still drink? I drink water. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to take a shot tonight for every tank you destroyed in World War II, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Did you, did you say you were on the 90 millimeter at one point? Well, yeah. we got that at the Ruhr. Right. Yeah. So there's another 90 millimeter gunner here, you know? Yeah, right. That's right. From Normandy and beyond. Right. I probably knew him. Right. Probably. <laughs> Does he look familiar? Yeah. <laughs> so Robert here was um, the, one of the biggest uh, anti-aircraft guns and one of the biggest shells in uh, World War II, operated of the 90 millimeter cannon, which had to be pulled by a, uh, a tractor. A tractor. Yeah. And uh, I'll let you tell these fine uh, men and women uh, of your role in World War II and uh, off to Boston College football after. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to be here and be with Andrew. Andrew's done an awful lot for us veterans, and I'll never forget it. But also, remembering the war. In England, I was with an infantry outfit, the one, the 29th Division, it didn't mean much to me, I didn't know anything about it, but lo and behold, they were going to hit Omaha Beach first wave, and we would have been right with them. They had to expect our guns. And we were waterproofing our guns, so we were through water like that, the guns wouldn't malfunction. So they said, they're not good enough. We were surprised. We thought we were all set. The 29th Division hit Normandy Beach, hit uh, uh, Omaha, and we didn't go to about four days later. It was kind of a blessing. Get on the beach, and we were occupied uh, there, and it took about a month and a half before General Patton showed up on the beach. Well, General Patton came up from Africa, uh, Italy, and he came on the beach. When he came on the beach, everything was at a dead still. Nobody could move. He didn't waste any time. He blasted a hole through St. Lowe. And we were right in line with the outfit that went through that hole. I went with a part of a tank division, the 4th Armored Division, and the 29th Division, and we went spearheading through that hole, liberating towns and going through France. And it was quite exciting. 
and we kept going along and going along. Finally, we were heading for the Rhine River, and that was a big concern. Crossing that Rhine River was like crossing that channel. It would have been a bloodbath. But how lucky we were. The leading tanks took over a, a bridge in Remagen in Germany that was blown and didn't fall. And so fortunately, we were able to get thousands of troops to cross that bridge, and we were right there to protect them. I shot a, a 90 millimeter gun, which was a copy of a German 88. Everybody knows what a German 88 gun because they had so much respect. Our gun was a copy of it, and we shot at airplanes and artillery outfits and things like that, but mostly airplanes. And uh, we went right across into Europe and so forth and uh, rescued an awful lot of things. And finally the war ended and I was in Austria and uh, thank goodness it all was over and I made it, so here I am. <laughs> Andy, can I have two more minutes? You can have whatever you want. Jack would like two more minutes. Yeah. I want to, George Patton's name has been kicked around here this afternoon. Uh, I was in the SAR, uh, in a truck going up to the front line to relieve the 26th Division. Open bed truck, no tarps, even temperature about 10 above. And I'm leaning over to the side, and I look down and here's George Patton sitting about five or six feet away from me. He just pulled up in his Jeep. And uh, the road up in front of us was a Twenty-eight days without taking my clothes off. Twenty-eight days without a toothbrush. Twenty-eight days without washing my hands. We were filthy, dirty, living like animals. But uh, but the end. The, we fortunately we were able to drive the Germans back into Germany. Okay, that's all I've got to say. <laughs> Thanks, <Nice> cool. <laughs> He went out 28 days without washing. I went about a year. <laughs> <laughs> that was without, your choice. <laughs> in the same clothes. <laughs> All we do is take our shoes off and put them into a sleeping bag, and that was it. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have sleeping bags. <laughs> they, they called him Stinky. <laughs> <laughs> Who here has been back to where they served in Europe? Who here has been back to, to where they served oh, overseas? I'm in there. Oh, you took yeah. me back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the fift, Fifteen times to <laughs> celebrate the freedom over there. And they've never forgotten it, I'm telling you. That's right. All the trips were free, uh, fl flying over, free hotels. Oh, great trip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, back where I fought. Even they took me to Hawaii and I didn't even fight over there. <laughs> but let me tell you one more story. One, this, this story needs to be told because I, I, I couldn't talk about it for a lot of years. But then I started to, to fit, five years ago, I was in Richmond and we still meet. My company still meets, but I'm about the only one left. And, and they put me on a Zoom across the United States in my uniform. And I told him this story about my, my driver. He was a Native American Indian, Albert Haskey. Oh, he was the greatest guy. I'm telling you, I hated to lose him. So we took this German village, and then we, we pulled the uh, M36 in the back of the backyard in case there was a counterattack, we'd be ready. Well, I couldn't traverse my gun because of the branches and stuff. He jumps out without even being told to cut the branches for me. Well, we got a terrific barrage of mortar shells, and a six-inch 
six feet in front of him, one of the shells hit the piece of shrapnel and went through his steel helm and come out the back. Well, no wonder I can't talk about it for 50 years. But then I started to talk about it, and I told that story on, on Zoom, and his great-great-nephew was named after him and lives in Texas, and he, can't, he couldn't wait to call me. Wow. And we're the best of friends now. Great. And he's, he's named after him, Albert asked. He has a smile like him, he laughs like him, he talks like him. I can tell a, a, a terrible story, story gives shelter. you a great story, too. So, just wanted to tell you that one. I haven't been back. So, Robert, everyone's been back. When do you want to go? Well, I had my hand up to, early. I wanted to ask the SEALs where I could enlist. Oh, yeah? <laughs> and become a SEAL. I notice you're holding a, a book. Do you want to tell uh, everybody what you're holding? Well, uh, I did a video in January, and it seemed to be good. And a friend sent it to another friend who sent it to another friend who was an author. She liked it and wanted to do a book of my life. And it's in print. I have one. I told Wes Smith. I got a copy for him, signed by the author and myself, and it's uh, me, my life, World War II, before and after. Excellent. Okay, great. So uh, I'm, I talked to Wes, and he knows him, but I don't know him by face, so I'm going <laughs> to run into him sooner or later, so I'm carrying the book around. <laughs> You'll see him. Andy? Yes, sir. I want to ask one question. Go ahead. Um, I think it's pos quite possible that I'm the only person, living person in the world today who saw both George Patton and Douglas MacArthur. That wasn't an easy job. They were fighting at opposite sides of the globe, but, but I did get to see both of them. If you, if you know anybody that did that, I'd like to hear from you. What about Betty Grable? Hmm? What about Betty, Betty Boop? <laughs> no, that, unfortunately that was, could not happen. <laughs> uh, well, go ahead, and then we're going to do Q and A. Uh, you had one last thing you wanted to say. Well, I'd just like to tell a little story that has a little humor to it. That happened during our liberation of the towns in France, and we would go after a, uh, something was captured, we'd defend it, and uh, we were moving along quite rapidly, and we pulled into this field in France someplace, and there was an a airstrip there that we were going to have to protect. We pulled into this field and drove across a bomb shelter. It didn't register much with me. We got down to the end of that field, set our guns down, and we ought to dug a foxhole. But the captain didn't give us time. He's noticed the German outfit not far away, and he wanted to fire on them. So he got permission and called us to action. We went to our guns. We had four guns, no foxholes. He said, fire four. Well, we started firing. I was firing the fourth. And just before I hit the lanyard of the fourth, I could see things happening. I knew it wasn't right. Everybody took off because we didn't have foxholes. They, they landed those shells in on us, one right after another. I had no place to go, so I ran for about 100 yards to this uh, bomb shelter. That was the only thing I could find. On the way, I had to keep hitting the ground. Shells were landing all over me and I'd get up and run and hit the ground. I finally got to that dugout. Luckily, there was only one other guy in it. I thought there'd be more. I wouldn't have room. I drove in there, shells popping around, and another guy drove in there, so three of us laying in this bomb shelter, digging us deeper if we could get <laughs> down lower. <laughs> and shells were landing all over us. And one hit the back of my uh, bunker, exploded. I guess something hit me in the rear end. Of all the places to get hit, that's the best place. 
the rear end. I thought I was bleeding and I couldn't even move to check it. When the shelling stopped, I felt, and it wasn't bleeding. A shell hit and bounced right off me, and I had a sore bum for months. <laughs> but that was a funny thing, because the guy in that ditch didn't have his helmet. And he said to me, Bob, let me have half of your helmet. I said, nothing I'm doing. So we hugged the ground down there, and he was digging in the ground. I'd be damned if he didn't come up with an old German, an old French helmet from the First World War that was buried in there. He took it out, brushed it off, put it on his head. <laughs> and he still had the German, the French peak on that helmet that they had in the First World War. <laughs> he looked so strange, I can't believe it. That <laughs> wasn't a good idea. <laughs> he, was, he felt better. <laughs> and when the shells stopped and we get out of there, we stood up there on top of that bunker, and he, he looked so silly, I couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> Luckily, we were saved. <laughs> One more. We get, yep, we got 60 seconds, and then I have to take uh, questions from the audience. Okay, then go, go with the questions. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to say something. Go ahead. Yeah. I've been back over uh, maybe three or four times, and um, the people in, in France, the little town, have been so, so thankful that we um, liberated their town, and they were so, such nice people we've made. Uh, friends with them. In fact, we have two of them here today. Would they stand up, please? Oh, that's awesome. Great. <laughs> great, great people. Very nice. Yeah. Beautiful. 